Amen. Thank you for the Word of God. Praise the Lord. I want you to get your Bibles, hold it up like you did your offering, and say this with me. Stand to your feet. Amen. And then remain standing for the reading of the Word. Okay? Hallelujah. This is my Bible, God's Holy Word. I can do what it says I can do. I can have what it says I can have. I can speak with new tongues. I heal the sick. I cast out demons, all in the name of Jesus. The Bible is my legal document, sealed by the blood of Jesus. Amen. Turning your Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 43 through 48. It's up on the screen. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies... Bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he, who may, for he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Father, I ask you right now in Jesus' name that you will bless this word, anoint us to preach your word under the power of the Holy Spirit. And I pray that you will, it will accomplish today, Lord, what you have sent it to accomplish. And we'll give you praise and glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen. Okay, I want you to watch a video. I want to show you the power of God's Word and how it transformed lives. Now, you, your life has already been transformed. You're here this morning, and Jesus has transformed your life. But I want you to watch this. It, it's about a four-and-a-half, five-minute video, okay? 48% of the Muslim in the United States of America believe that... There are Muslim first, there are American second. Our purpose is to change this culture because they're infidel and what they're doing is not pleasing to Allah and we are the soldier of Allah who will make them do it. Kamal Salim was born in Lebanon to a devout Muslim family. As early as four years old, he remembers sitting at the kitchen table while his mother taught him about the Quran and his duty to Allah and Jihad. From my childhood, my mom said, one day you'll be a martyr, my son. You will die for the sake of Allah and you will exalt Islam. She said, if you kill a Jew, my son, well, your hand will light up before the throne of Allah and the host of heaven will celebrate what you have done. Kamal was seven when his parents sent him to Muslim training camps to learn to use weapons and engage and kill the enemy. The boys were also taught another, more subtle form of warfare. We were training for what's called culture jihad, which is shifting cultures. Culture jihad is... It's unlike the sword, unlike the rifle, it is the jihad that will come into your world. By his 20s, Kamal was chosen to wage cultural jihad on America. In Islam, uh, liberty, freedom, monarchy, all these are idols and these must be brought down. So the liberty that you have in the United States of America, it's, it's anti-Islam. You know, so America must be changed. So I moved to the Bible Belt specifically. The Bible Belt was the strongest of the strongest. Uh, that's where the, uh, the stout Christians are. And I want to take on the best of the best because I considered myself as, as a sword of Islam. I thought I'm anointed, I'm unique, I'm selected. I'm coming to a country and a culture to change it. And I have the power of Allah with me. In the early 1980s, Kamal entrenched himself in a small Midwestern town. He began targeting men from poor neighborhoods to recruit them to the Muslim faith. But one afternoon, his life would be in the hands of those he hated the most. I was going from one place to another to do a recruitment, and that day I had a car wreck. The car wreck was so severe, I ejected out of my car, landed on my neck, broke my neck in two places. This man came running to me, and he said, don't worry. We're going to take care of you, and everything's going to be all right. The ambulance came and picked me up, 
and now I go to the hospital, the orthopedic surgeon in the emergency room looked at my chart and he just said, son, we are going to take care of you and everything's going to be all right. The second day I wake up in the hospital and this uh, physical therapy, head of physical therapy come and read my chart and he turned around and he said the same thing word for word, we are going to take care of you. At first, Kamal was frightened by their words because these men were all Christians. You see, in terrorism, if they said, we're going to take care of you, you'd better run. Surgeries to repair Kamal's broken neck were successful, but recovery would take weeks. After being discharged from the hospital, he would need someone to care for him while he recuperated. Kamal had no one. So the orthopedic surgeon opened up his own home to this stranger. In his home, they put me in the choicest room, in the most beautiful thing. I became like part of their family. They didn't see me any different. And now they have a basket set for Kamal. They put in money to free my bills from the hospital. Kamal was overwhelmed with the outpouring of Christian love. As he recovered, he began to help out around the house with cooking and cleaning. They have Jewish friends that came from Israel that they support, you know. And now I'm hugging Israelis and I'm cooking for Jews. I go, what has happened to me? When Kamal was able to take care of himself and return to his apartment, the doctor had another surprise for him. He said, this is the keys to the house, and here's an extra key. This is your new car. We just want to bless you. You can come anytime you want. So I go to my home, and I go to my cold place that I have been there in months, and dust is this thick. And I just got to settle this issue with my God to know that if, if it's real or not. So I walk inside, I shut the door, I go right in the eastern window and I fall on my knees and I put my hands to the heavens and I cry up to my God. Allah, Allah, my Lord and my King, why have you done such a thing to me? I'm okay with the, with the car wreck. I'm okay with all this, but why did you put me among Christians? I'm confused. These Christian and Jews, they are, they're good people. There's nothing wrong with them. They don't want to kill us. They're not the same thing that I learned about them. Allah, these people have relationship with their God. These people, they cry out to the God and they answer them. I want to hear your voice. I want to hear you love me. If you're real, speak to me. I want to hear your voice. Just guess what Allah said that day? Absolutely nothing. Kamal felt that because he questioned his faith, the honorable thing to do was to end his own life. So I went to reach out my guns and put it in the right place and clock out. I heard the voice. The voice knew me by name. He said, come on, come on, come on. Why don't you call on God of Father Abraham and Isaac and Jacob? And now I fell on my knees and I put my hands to the heavens immediately as I heard the voice and I cried out with every fiber within me. God, the Father Abraham, if you are real, would you speak to me? God, the Father Abraham, if you are real, I want to know you. Well, God, the Father Abraham came to the room and he filled the room with his glory and his name was Yahweh. The Lord is one. In his hand, he has holes in his hand. He has holes in his feet. His name is Jesus. I said to him, who are you, my Lord? Who are you? He said, I am that I am. I said, I'm a simple man with a simple mind. What is that supposed to mean? He said, I am the Alpha. I am the Omega. I am the beginning. I am the end. I am everything that is in between. I have known you before I formed the foundation of the earth. I have loved you before I formed you in your mother womb. Rise up. Rise up, come on. Kum. You are my warrior. You are not their warrior. And I said to him, I said, my Lord, my Lord, I will live and die for you. He said, do not die for me. I died for you that you may live. That day, instead of taking his life, Kamal gave it to Jesus. He now has a new mission and travels the country challenging Muslims to question their allegiance to Allah. My heart desire is to reach out for my brothers and sisters, the Muslim out there, 1.5 billion Muslim that they are living out there and they have not tasted freedom and that freedom in God. It's been over 20 years since Kamal left the Islamic faith 
and even threats of violence and death cannot stop him from sharing his story. He is real. You know, and if you never experienced God before in your life, if you never tasted God and if you think you got nothing to lose, when, when you're sitting in your home, whether you're a Muslim or, or a non-Muslim or a non-Christian or whatever you are, say, call on God of Father Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and say, if you are real, speak to me, I want to hear your voice. Do you realize what we have? Just think of who we are this morning and what we hold in our hands is what the world needs. The one who lives in our heart is the one the world needs. Now in this video you saw some people who were above average. And I want to speak this morning about being above average. Being above average. You see, there are doors that are open now that have never been opened before. The doors uh, we, we've proclaimed throughout 2014, open doors in 2014. People are searching for truth. This man was searching for truth when he fell on his knees and he called out to the only God that he had ever known, which was Allah. He was searching for truth. He was searching for relationship. And that God could not answer him. Worldwide, governments are struggling with human tragedies. Searching for answers. You know, we're very critical of, of Barack Obama, and I understand that, and we have reason to be. But I would hate to be in the man's shoes having to try to deal with Muslims, trying to deal with, with, the, with uh, ISIS, trying to deal... You know, what, what is the correct answer? We all seem to think that we may actually have it, and most of our answers are just take a bomb and blow them off the face of the earth, and we're done with it. That may not be what God wants. Have you thought of that? That might not be what God wants. That's why it's so important that we pray for our leaders. But governments are struggling with tragedy, human tragedies and looking for answers. And we have it. And we have it. What are we doing with the open doors in 2001-4 with social media? We just used it for one thing to bring you a word this morning through social media. That was a video found on Facebook. The fallen nature of man has caused him to search and to look and to seek for answers. And Jesus asked us this question, what are we doing that is more than what the world is doing? What are we doing at RCF that is any more than what the world is doing? I heard an illustration of a boy, a little boy comes home with his report card. And man, he's so excited. He's skipping home, got his report card. He can't wait to show it to his daddy. And he runs in all excited. Dad, dad, I got my report card. Wait till you see it. The dad gets the report card and looks at it and, and uh, frowns and says, Son, why are you so excited about this report card? He said, Dad, there's no D's and F's. And the dad says, but son, there's no A's and B's. It's all C's. And he says, I didn't bring you into this world to be average. Jesus did not save us to be average. That's scripture. The publican and sinner can love the one who loves them. It's easy to love the person who loves you. It's easy to give to the person that gives to you. It's easy to pray for the person that prays for you.
But what about the ones that despitefully use you? What about the ones that persecute you? What about this man we saw in this video, this Muslim? Did you see any above average people in that video? What about those doctors that were Christians that walked in his room and said, we're going to take care of you? Three of them, we're going to take care of you. They all said the same thing, we're going to take care of you. And then a doctor in a Midwestern city, this wasn't the Northeast. Well, I might ought to thank God it wasn't the South. They might have presented a gun in the doc, in the, to a Muslim. I'm being serious. But in a Midwestern city, we find that a doctor takes this Muslim into his own home because he has no family. Is that above average? Was that above what was required of that doctor? Did he have to do that? He didn't have to do it. He could have said, sorry, sir, I've done all of my, my duty and you're on your own now. I've released you from the hospital. Go, go down to the Y. Find Barney Fife down at the Y. <laughs> Go down over here somewhere. And, you know. But no, that doctor was above average. He said, I'm going to take you into my home. And I'm going to nurture you and nourish you. And I'm going to show you. Now he didn't tell him these words. But what did he show that Muslim man? He showed him Christianity. He showed him Jesus. When that Muslim man walked into that room, into that home, he didn't know who he was seeing, but he was seeing Jesus. He was seeing Jesus. When somebody walks into RCF, they don't need to see me, and they don't need to see you. They need to see Jesus when they walk in these doors. When we hand out spaghetti dinners next Saturday, they don't need to see the person handing out the spaghetti dinner. They need to see Jesus feeding the community. They need to see Jesus got His hand out handing the people instead of taking from them. The Muslim faith takes from people and Jesus gives back to people. The Muslim faith steals their liberty, steals their freedom, steals their joy, steals who they are in Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, I give it back to you wholeheartedly. I give it all to you. And he spreads his arms out like this. And what did that man see? He saw the nail-scarred hands of Jesus. He saw the pierced side. He saw Jesus. Because above average people was taking care of him. He was in contact with above average people. Now let's go back and let's read our text again and let's see what Jesus was saying. You see, we, 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 a lot of people have said, well, we live in the, land, the time of grace and the Ten Commandments aren't necessarily uh, uh, important for today. They're not part of today's culture. Well, I challenge you to read the Beatitudes and you'll gladly go back to the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments said, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But Jesus said, If you look upon a woman with lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery in your heart. Now which one sounds harder to you? You might want to rethink that position. The Beatitudes was the longest sermon that Jesus preached. What we find here, as He was reading, as He was preaching here in Matthew at the Beatitudes, this is what he said. I'm going to read the entire text again because now with, with the introduction, and I had not even got to the sermon yet, the introduction, he says, You have heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now I want you to think of that video. You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Who does this country hate? Muslims. Muslims. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Well, I believe I'm just going to take that out of my Bible. That you may be sons of your father in heaven. Wait a minute. That sounds like a condition. That sounds like Jesus put a condition on something. Why do I need to do that 
so that you may become sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his son, the sun that's in the sky, rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. In other words, God's, God loves everybody. God loves everybody. God loves... Did you know that God loves the men who took the sword, the knife, and beheaded the two American journalists? Did you know God loves them? How many of us, and I don't want you to raise your hand, how many of us have prayed for those who permitted or committed that act? We hadn't prayed for them. Kill them! Give back to them exactly what they've given to us. That's the Christian's response. But that's not the response of Jesus in Matthew. I should have just quit while I was ahead and not even preached. Had <laughs> You see, we find here, as we read on for, if you love those who love you, what reward have you? What what reward was this doctor going to get by taking this Muslim man into his home? Was he going to get some kind of materialistic reward that this world, oh, look at this fine doctor, look what he did. Was that what he was looking for? Do not even the tax collectors do that? And the tax collectors were the most hated people of all time. They were the Muslims. <laughs> that time they was ISIS. <laughs> and if you greet your brethren only, in other words, you only greet those who you consider your brothers, what do you do more than any others? Do not even the tax collectors do that as well? Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. That means above average, y'all. Uh, daughter, you're having surgery. Would you rather have a doctor that made C's or one that made A's? That's what I thought. And a Christian. The challenge this morning is to be above average. There are a lot of average Christians out there. Average Joe. Average means you keep everything bottled up in here. You don't excel at anything. You don't fail, but you don't excel. You don't fail. Get that in mind now. I'm not calling everybody in here failures, okay? So don't anybody go say, boy, the preacher taught us we're all failures. No. An average person doesn't fail, but they don't excel. Now, if you're going to excel at anything in life, you need to excel in serving Jesus. Because when you excel in serving Jesus, He'll bring you up from the bottom of those other places that you might be weak in. He will, make those, he will, he will be your strength in those times. So we find here that in our text, point number one, our text, the Beatitudes, Jesus' longest sermon, we find that we must not allow ourselves to escape from the reality of what Jesus has told us to do here. You see, the reputation of the church in many areas is below average. The reputation of the church, by the world's view, is below average. But I watched something this morning on a video that discounted that theory and threw it out the window when it showed me a man that was above average, that went above the the extra mile to show a young man that he didn't know if he would ever serve God or not, but he reached out in love. You see, did he take him to church? It didn't say he did, did it? Did did he get his Bible and, and read to him? It didn't say he did. He may have done that. But the point is, he opened up his home, he opened up his heart, and he showed this man the love of Jesus Christ in his own way. You can show people Jesus in this sanctuary all day long, but where you really need to be showing people Jesus is out there in the workplace, amongst the heathen, amongst the publicans and sinners, and letting them know that Jesus is the answer. 
We can preach it in here till we're blue in the face and you'll stare at me just like you are right now. They need to hear it out there. But you've got to be above average. You've got to excel in your own prayer walk. I would dare to say that doctor probably spent a lot of time praying. I would imagine he probably had a prayer life. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been able to hear the Holy Spirit speaking to him and say, take this young man in. I don't know that that doctor took in anybody else before then or since. Have no idea, don't know who he is. But you see, the point is, he was able to listen to the Holy Spirit say, this young man you need to, you need to nurture. Now, that man today, the Muslim, the one that, Khalil, the one that got saved, why is it, why is it that he is now reaching hundreds of Muslims and converting them to Christianity, the only reason is because one man was above average that showed him the love of Jesus Christ. One man was above average and showed him the love of Jesus Christ, and now that man is converted, and he's reaching out to thousands of Muslims in this country, converting them to Christianity. Because one man dared to make A's. One man dared to bring his report card home to Jesus and say, look at this. No D's, no F's, no C's, and no B's. All A's, Lord. All A's. You say, does Jesus really want us to do that? Well, he says that that be ye perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. I would say that's a pretty strong suggestion. God wants us to be above average. You think? Above average. That means, as a Christian, you can't live like the world does. It may not be a sin to do a certain thing, but when it's associated with sin, sometimes the Christian needs to to flee from the very appearance of evil. That's being above average. A Christian needs to have above average communication from his mouth. The sinner might get gone a cussing fit when he gets mad. But a Christian should never, y'all listen to me, the Christian should never allow filthy or corrupt communication to come from his lips. That's what the scripture says. That's above average. That's above average. What about when you're out there and you talk to somebody about how much Jesus loves them and you share all this about Jesus and then they're watching you because you've, they've, you have got their attention now. They're watching you like a hawk. I promise you when you tell people about Jesus, they're going to watch you because they can't wait for you to mess up. And so many times we oblige them. We're human, but you know what? Be ye perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. We've used that age-old excuse, well, I'm human. Did God not know we was human when He wrote the Scripture? Did God not know we was human when He wrote the Scripture? He knew we were human. So we don't need to use the human thing as an excuse. We need to understand that God expects us to be above average. God expects us to go the extra mile. Oh, y'all look like y'all are so nervous this morning. Y'all are making me nervous. The church has gotten a bad reputation, sometimes rightfully so. But you know what? The publicans got a bad reputation and they rose above it. They accepted Jesus. This Muslim man had a bad reputation, but he rose above it because the above average life of another man Many have spoiled the reputation of the church through their failures. But remember this, God has not asked us this morning. We are not failures. We are not failures. Y'all understand that? We are not failures. We are who God has called us to be. We find that the requirements to be above average. Point number three, there you go. Above average. What are the requirements to be above average? Using that scripture, be ye, be ye perfect as I am perfect. First of all, you need to understand something. We are complete in Jesus Christ. We are complete in Him. I can't complete you. You can't complete me. We can't complete one another. In Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead. In Christ, in Jesus, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead. And we are made complete in Him. This means that 
if we are in Jesus Christ, he is in us, then he gives us the ability to be able to go the extra mile. He gives us the ability to be above average. We can change the face of our life through Jesus Christ. How many of you have changed the face of your life because you've accepted Jesus as your Savior? Where, I want you to think a minute. Where would you be today if you had not accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Where would you be? Just think about that. What would your life be like? But because Jesus was above average and died for you, you've changed the face of your life. You can change the face of your family. Can I say that again? You can change the face of your family. How many of you this morning says, I have a family that its face really needs to be changed? Did you know how that you can do that? By being above average yourself. Being above average yourself. Don't get into their quarrels and their arguments and their, and their all that kind of stuff. Not to say that you're better than they are. Love them. Shower them with love. Shower them with compassion. Shower them with the love of Jesus Christ. Shower them with these things. But don't enter into their, into their foolishness and drama. Stay away from that part. Let Jesus shine through you. You can change the face of your friends by being above average. You can change the face of your church by being above average. And a church can change the face of its community by being above average. By being above average. The followers of Jesus dared to believe Jesus and they turned their world upside down for the cause of Jesus Christ. Because they were above average. In conclusion today, we need to know this one thing. We have an above average calling which requires an above average commitment to an above average God and be filled with an above average Holy Spirit and get baptized with an above average water baptism and do all that God calls us to do because He's above average. We're going to be above average. Let God pull you up today. You can't pull yourself up. You know, when I was in, when I was in, in the first grade, let's go back. I didn't go to kindergarten because um, in that day, it was an option. It wasn't a requirement like this, and so uh, it cost. And so being from my family, the youngest of seven kids, anything that cost, we didn't do. <laughs> it was only the necessities that we got. I never will forget Fridays. Fridays was a special day. My dad had come home from work, and that's when we got the only uh, soda pop we got for the entire week was on Friday afternoon. And my dad would walk, walk, come home from work. He'd give us a quarter. A quarter. There was a store at the end of our street. That quarter didn't even hit our pocket, brother. We <laughs> held it in our hand. And we raced to that store, and I could get a Coke and a candy bar and five pieces of gum for that quarter. That was Friday. That's when it was TGIF, brother. <laughs> we, was, we, we, was, we didn't care that we was wearing the same shoes that we wore last year. We didn't care if in the summertime we didn't have any shoes on at all. We had that quarter. And if, 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 if mom and dad worked a little bit of overtime, we got a special treat on Saturday. They gave us 50 cents to go to the movies. Because you could get in for a quarter and you could get your popcorn and your drink and go and sit and watch a movie on Saturday afternoon. Boy, that you talk about living life. I don't, now I'm telling you what, it was awesome. It was awesome. But you see, in first grade, I never wanted to show my mom and dad my report card because I'll be honest with you, I made all F's. All F's. They passed me because the teacher told my mom that they knew I could do it. I was just lazy. Well, I was the youngest of seven. I was spoiled rotten. When my grandma came to live with us, she was blind. She lived in Indianapolis, but in the summer she'd come and stay with us. And uh, we had chores to do, and I didn't want to do that because I knew that if I didn't do it, my grandma would slip me a quarter. Now, Ricky, you go do your chores like your mom and dad told you. And I'd get a quarter all the time. My sisters never got a quarter from Grandma because they did theirs. 
Second grade, it started out F's again. And I never forget, I got an F on the spelling test, and I brought it home. And I took it and I threw it in the trash can, but I forgot to wad it up. <laughs> My mom come home from work, and she saw that spelling test, and she was supposed to have had to sign it. But I threw it away. Mr. Belt, meet Mr. Rick. Y'all probably never heard of that around here. Uh, <clears throat> she didn't wait for Daddy to get home. Mom spanked harder than Daddy anyway. She got you by the arm, and you went around in a circle. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about, don't you? <laughs> she didn't let you run. You're just going in that circle, and boy, she was, she was swinging that belt. Woo! And you was ready for her to stop. At any minute, I'll do better. I'll make better grades. I'll make better grades. I promise, I promise, I promise. And guess what I did? I went from an F student to an A student. God brought me through a little bit of uh, help from my mom <laughs> from being below average to being above average. And I never made another F on a report card ever since that time. And thank God I don't have to take any more. <laughs> but you see, motivation. What does God need to do to us to motivate us? The woodshed? Discipline? Now, I don't know, you know, I don't know what the answer is for you, but, but this morning in worship, God was trying so hard to get some of you to move out because worship is bottled up inside of you. God wants you to be an above average worshiper. God wants you to be an above average employee. Whoever you work for, and if they know you're a Christian, you need to be the best employee they've got because you're representing your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They need to see it in your attitude. They need to see it in your work ethic. They need to see it in all areas of your life. They need to see an above average person. If you're representing Jesus, then you need to be above average. I need to be above average. That's our calling. That's our calling. So let's pay attention to our life. Let's pay attention to our relationships. Let's go the extra mile. Let's love our enemies. Let's pray for those who despitefully use us. You know what? And I'm closing with this. I heard uh, or read, I don't remember now, but uh, where there's several airplanes, I don't remember the number, several air airplanes that are missing in Iran. And the fear is that they're going to use those airplanes for a terrorist attack on 9-11. Okay? Now, should that make us afraid? Or should that make us be above average and pray? How would you pray? God let them crash before they get here? Or would, or, would you, or would you pray for the, your enemy that's going to despitefully use you and say, God, save them. Visit them by the Holy Spirit. When they get in the cockpit of that airplane, let the Holy Spirit flood that place and jam the controls where they can't even get off the ground. Do so. But Lord, let them understand. Let these people, because it, it most likely would be a suicide mission and when they, when they crash, they're going to go to hell. Is that where Jesus wants them? No. Is that where you want them? Don't answer We have an opportunity to pray. Does my intercession really work? Did it help Abraham and Lot? Did Abraham's intercession help Lot? Guess what? Your intercession will help in these situations too. But it's got to be above average. Whistle while I work. 
Oh, Lord, take care of those Muslims. Do, 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 do. Are you going to get down on your knees and you're going to really intercede and call on the God of heaven to take care of a situation? Or instead of whistling while you work, just going to say a little passing prayer and hope it gets the job done. Above average. Above average. Would you bow your head with me? Lord, I thank you because there are above average people. And there are Christians that are going the extra mile. Father, we saw evidence of that today. We saw evidence today of people going the extra mile when they didn't have to. But because of who lives in them, they wanted to share with others. I pray, Lord, that you will put and instill in us today the mentality to be above average in all of our doings. To be above average in our Christian walk. To be above average in our commitments to our employer. To be above average in everything that we do, Lord. To do our very, very best. Father, yeah, you will accept us with C's. You will. You'll open the gates of heaven and we'll walk in. But Lord, how much greater the reward to those when Jesus looks at us and says, Well done, thou good and faithful servant.